sinner. He was surprised and said, How is this possible? Not knowing, he wanted to learn the reason. I said to him, Father, you who are the most important person here, how do you see yourself in this town? He answered me saying, I consider myself to be great and the first in the town. I said to him, How do you see yourself when you go to Caesarea? He replied, There I see myself as insignificant amongst the important men of the town. Again I said to him, How do you see yourself when you go to Antioch? He replied, I see myself as a peasant. I then said to him, When you go to Constantinople near the emperor, how do you see yourself? I consider myself to be a beggar, he answered. After all this, I said to him, Look, this happens with the saints. The more they approach God, the more they see themselves as sinners. Thus, when Abraham saw the Lord, he called himself dust and ashes. Isaiah also said, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips. Likewise Daniel, when he was in the lion's den, and Habakkuk brought him his meal, saying, Take the meal which God sent to you, replied, Did God remember even me? You see what great humility he had in his heart. When he was among the lions in the den, and they did not harm him not just once but twice, he was surprised and said, Did God remember even me? Do you see the humility of the saints, how their hearts are moved? Even when God sent them to help other people, they did not agree to this easily, out of humility and to avoid glory. Like a man wearing a null silk garment, if someone throws a dirty rag at him, he leaves so as not to ruin his expensive clothes. It is with the saints, who are dressed in virtues, and avoid human glory in order not to be defiled. However, those who seek glory are like a naked man trying to find a small rag or anything else to cover his indecency. The person who is naked of virtues seeks the glory of people. Therefore, when God sent the saints to help other people, they did not agree to this easily because of their humility. Thus Moses said, I beg you, find another one capable to be sent, since I am weak in speech and slow of tongue. Also Jeremiah said, I am a youth. To put it simply, each one of the saints obtained humility by keeping the commandments faithfully. Nobody can express what this humility is in words and how it grows within the soul unless he learns about it through experience. No one can learn about it from words alone. At one time, when Abba Zosimas was talking about humility, one of the sophist philosophers was there listening to what he was saying. He wanted to learn exactly what he meant, and he asked him, Tell me, why do you consider yourself to be a sinner? Do you not know that you are a saint? Do you not know that you have virtues? Can you not see that you are practicing the commandments? How can you believe that you are a sinner since you do all these things? The elder could not find words to formulate his answer, but he simply said to him, I do not know how to explain it to you, but that's the way it is. The sophist insisted and wanted to learn how this could be so. The elder, not finding words to explain it to him, started saying in his saintly simplicity, Do not misunderstand me. Indeed, I am a sinner. When I saw the elder wondering how to answer, I said to him, I wonder, is this not like sophistry and medicine? When, for example, the doctor or sophist learns the art of medicine or sophistry well and practices it, it gradually becomes a habit for him. And, as I said, 
Little by little, the soul imperceptibly assumes this art by the practicing of it. This is more or less the same with humility when, by keeping the commandments, humility becomes a habit and it is not possible to give an explanation of this in words. When Abba Zosimas heard this, he was happy, embraced me and said, You found it. It is like you said. The sophist was also satisfied and he himself accepted that explanation. The elders told us certain things that we might understand humility, but none of them could explain the disposition of the soul. When Abba Agathon was on the point of death, the brothers said to him, Are even you afraid, father? He replied, In my whole life I have done what I could to keep the commandments, but I am a human being. How do I know if my work was pleasing God, since the judgment of God is different from the judgment of men? Thus he opened our eyes to understanding humility and showed us the way to achieve it. But what its nature is and how the soul obtains it, as I often said, none found or could understand, but only the soul which became worthy to learn about it by actions. The fathers pointed out to us what it is that brings humility. The sayings of the fathers tell of a brother who asked an elder, What is humility? The elder replied, Humility is great and divine work, and the way leading towards it is that of hard bodily labor which we do in full knowledge of what we are doing. Moreover, it is also to consider yourself under all and to pray ceaselessly to God. This is the way to humility, but humility itself is divine and cannot be comprehended. Why did he say that hard bodily labor brings the soul to humility? In what sense is physical labor a virtue of a soul? To consider oneself under all, as we have said earlier, is against the first kind of pride. How can someone who considers himself to be under all consider himself to be greater than his brother or to be proud of something or to blame or humble somebody? Likewise, it is evident that ceaseless prayer is contrary to the second pride. It is clear that the humble, devout person, knowing that it is impossible to achieve any good thing in the soul without the help and protection of God, does not stop praying and asking God, in prayer, to be merciful to him. The person who always prays to God when he manages to do something knows how he managed it. He cannot be conceited nor ascribe it to his own strength, but ascribes every achievement to God and always thanks him, calling upon his help, trembling that he might lose his help and that his sickness and weakness might be revealed. Thus, he prays in his humility and through prayer, he humbles himself, and the more he achieves, the more he humbles himself. Inasmuch as he humbles himself, he receives the help of God and progresses in humility. Why did he say that hard bodily labor brings humility? What does hard bodily labor have to do with the disposition of a soul? I shall tell you. Since the soul has fallen from the keeping of God's commandment into transgression, the wretched thing was given up, as St. Gregory says, to the seeking of pleasure, to independence that leads to error, and to the love of things of the body. In a certain sense, it was found to be at one with the body, and it became flesh, as it says, My spirit shall not strive with man for ever for he is indeed flesh. From then on, the wretched soul has been suffering together with the body, and it is in accordance with all things done by it. This is why the elder said that hard bodily labor leads to humility. It is well known that the soul of a person in perfect health 
has a different disposition from that of a sick person. In addition, the soul of a hungry man differs from that of a person who is well fed. Again, the soul of a person seated on a horse has a different disposition from that one seated on a donkey. Likewise, the souls of a person seated on a throne and a person seated on the ground, of a person well dressed and a person in rags. Hard work, therefore, humbles the body, and when it is humbled, the soul is likewise. Therefore, it is well said that hard bodily labor leads to humility. For this reason, when Evagrius was tempted by blasphemy, knowing very well that blasphemy comes from pride, and also that when the body is humbled, the soul is humbled with it, he spent forty days without shelter, so that his body, as the writer said, became full of ticks like the wild animals. This labor was not for the blasphemy, but for humility. The elder rightly said that hard bodily labor leads to humility. God who is good grants us humility since it delivers man from great evils and protects him from great temptations. For to him belongs glory to the ages.